welcome to Very Honored Fraternity Tears, Esoteric Nerd Podcast, episode 125. Um, I'm going to call this one more non-dual, but later I might change the title of it to August and Ray's 3. For now, I'm just calling it more non-dual and not promoting the heck out of it. Um, for the people who are currently mourning uh, August and Ray's, he passed away the night before last. I'm not sure why, what the details are. Um, he was on episode 80. We did that conversation, oh, I don't know, a few years ago. At the time, he was an impurator. And then later, more, much more recently, October of 2022, um, we did this one which was originally called Non-Dual, and I changed it to August and Race 2 yesterday. Today is February 3rd, 2023. So this episode is um, in his honor. I'm, I, don't have, I don't really have the words. I, uh, I sat and wrote something, and it took me a while to come up with one and a half, two lines, basically something to the effect of, I am very glad to, or very happy to know August and Ray's. I didn't want to say have known, put it in the past, especially given the kinds of conversations he and I would have about the nature of time and life and death and duality, non-duality, existence, non-existence. And so I'm very happy to know him. And, um, uh, the world needs more humble, profound, funny, intelligent, kind people, not less. I know it's fewer. It just sounds wrong if I say fewer. Sometimes colloquial speech. Um, is more appropriate. I don't know, maybe that's wrong, but nonetheless, I raise a glass to my brother and I wish you Godspeed on your journey from this world. Um, for today, what I'm gonna do is take our audio conversations that we had mostly in 2020. And uh, you, if you're a longtime follower of this podcast, you know that I talk a lot. Um, you know, I call these interviews with the guests, but then sometimes I clarify and say they're more like conversations to try to excuse the fact that if you were to actually take a stopwatch in time, who's talking, it might be more than half me and less than half the, uh, the interviewee. Well, what would happen was I would send Augustine you know, a 45 minute audio note and he'd reply with a 20 minute audio note. So what I, I've done my best to trim down my own babbling. So this isn't just, you know, four hours of me talking mostly and then occasionally Augustine's voice. I've intentionally left most of his, even the parts where he's thinking and saying, um, or, you know, sorting through his things, trying to find his notes, mostly for the sake of people who miss him and want to hear his voice. The uh, things we talk about are also interesting, you know, for those who don't know uh, him and aren't here on that level. Um, we talk about everything from basically Buddhism, Golden Dawn, generally speaking, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, Zen and Vajrayana and, you know, other Buddhism in general, Hinduism a little, kind of Indian philosophy on the one hand, and uh, and Golden Dawn paradigm, egregore, if you will, uh, and Greek philosophers and things like that on the other. So 
like I said, I've done my best to trim down me talking, so you'll hear him say, now at 24 minutes and 13 seconds, you mentioned this, and here are my thoughts about that, but you won't have actually heard the thing that I said because I cut it out. Um, the audio here is gonna open with 10 minutes of me talking, and then it'll go to August, and so if you wanna skip ahead, I understand. Um, and uh, so, no segment for this one. I hope everybody's doing well. And uh, let's get to those audio files, shall we? So we were just chatting, and uh, so I've made my coffee. And so now I shall record. Is this working? Hello. So in um, Shobogenzo, there was a uh, particular lecture he gave that became the chapter called Uji. And uh, Uji, it was in an earlier translation, when they were translating it into English, they translated it as being but for a little while. And there's this whole thing where the authors, the translators, Nak Nish Nakajimi, I forget his name, don't have it in front of me, um, was talking about it how they chose to just get right to the point of what uji means and not make it flowery and kind of change not change the meaning of it so it's existence time uji existence time i mean you know being but for a little while sounds like some kind of romantic poet you know what I mean? Like, it's a, it, it adds kind of an emotion that isn't there in the in the in the actual uh, old Japanese. So what I used to do, and I used to enjoy doing, was when there was a chapter of Shobogenzo that I particularly liked, or especially which uh, struck me as being very poetic. Like Dokin would like he he's like poetic, but then he'll go on and on with something very specific or he'll repeat himself or he'll make a point over and over the talk about the dumb people that see it another way or you know this kind of thing so what I would do was I would edit out anything extraneous and boil it down to a sort of essence so it's a poem that is the words of Dogen but it's like pruned like a uh, like a bonsai tree like you know if you have like a bushes growing everywhere and then someone comes in and trims it down to make one very simple form like a sphere or something like that so that's what i've done and that's what i'm going to read is my shortened poetic version version of his lecture which is translated as existence time and i think it relates somehow to something you had said okay here we go <clears throat> Existence time. Sometimes standing on top of the highest peak. Sometimes moving along the bottom of the deepest ocean. Sometimes the earth and space. We can never measure how long and distant or how short and pressing 12 hours is. The leaving and coming of the directions and traces of time are clear, so people do not doubt it. That does not mean they know it. Doubt is nothing other than time. We put our self in order and see the resulting state as the whole universe. Moment of time does not hinder moment of time. There are minds which are made up in the same moment of time. And there are moments of time in which the same mind is made up. Self is time. When we arrive in the field of the ineffable, there is just one thing and one phenomenon, here and now, beyond understanding of phenomena and non-understanding of phenomena, beyond understanding of things and non-understanding of things. Real existence is only this exact moment. 
all moments of existence time are the whole of time. Let us pause to reflect whether or not any of the whole of existence or any of the whole universe has leaked away from the present moment of time. We should not learn that flying is the only ability of time. If we just left time to fly away, some gaps in it might appear. Those who fail to experience and to hear the truth of existence time do so because they understand time only as having passed. To grasp the pivot and express it. All that exists throughout the whole universe is lined up in a series and at the same time is individual moments of time. Because time is existence time, it is my existence time. Human skin bags recognize time as leaving and coming. None has penetrated it as existence time abiding. Who can express the state of having already attained the ineffable? Even Bodhi and Nirvana are merely a form which leaves and comes, existence time. Without any cessation of restrictions and hindrances, existence time is realized. Celestial kings and celestial throngs now appearing to the right and to the left are the existence time in which we are now exerting ourselves. Elsewhere, beings of existence time, of land and sea, are realized through our own exertion now. The whole universe is neither beyond moving and changing nor beyond progressing and regressing. It is passage from one moment to the next. The momentary passing of spring, for example, inevitably passes moment by moment through spring itself. All these situations are existence time. In accordance with this truth, the bright star appears. The suchness appears. The eye appears. Picking up a flower appears. And this is just time. Sometimes the will is present, but the words are absent. Sometimes the words are present, but the will is absent. Sometimes the will and the words are both present. Sometimes the will and the words are both absent. The will and the words are both existence time. Presence and absence are both existence time. The moment of presence has not finished. Presence is not related to having come, and absence is not related to not having come. Existence time is like this. Presence is restricted by presence. It is not restricted by absence. Absence is restricted by absence. It is not restricted by presence. The will hinders the will and meets the will. Words hinder words and meet words. Restriction hinders restriction and meets restriction. Restriction restricts restriction. This is time. Restriction is utilized by objective reality, but restriction that restricts objective reality has never occurred. I meet with a human being. A human being meets with a human being. I meet with myself. And manifestation meets with manifestation. Though venerable patriarchs hitherto have each spoken as they have, how could there be nothing further to say? I would like to say, the half-presence of will and words is existence time. The half-absence of will and words is existence time. When we experience coming and experience leaving, 
when we experience presence and experience absence, like this, that time is existence time. So there it is. That was uh, spoken by Dogen in 1242 at a, a temple called Kosho Horinji. I'm not sure where that is. I keep having these weird issues where I uh, record something, then I go back to listen and it's gone or it's just non-existent. Um, I, I mean, like the file's there, but the audio data is missing. Anyways, um, that piece reminds me, one, I, I haven't heard that. Two, the portion of the Shobogenzo that I do have is not the full Shobogenzo, clearly, because I've only got the one volume, and um, I think I, I was put onto that translation by Brad Warner, who's another author, another Zen Buddhist author, um, and he made it sound like the one that I bought was a complete version, but clearly after hearing um, what you translated, that is not the case. That's an amazing trans. Well, yeah, it's an amazing translation, and it you know, it makes me wonder whether or not I think Dogen is a squirrely teacher, like I was mentioning, like Rupert Spira before. You know, um, I mean, why not? You know, Dogen's amazing. He can be squirrely, just like anybody else. That's like that uh, that old joke about how. Uh, Picasso went to a lawyer's house in the south of France because, you know, the lawyer wanted him to look over all of his work and, um, you know, all the work, rather, that, that he had purchased that, that belonged to Picasso. And he, as he's flipping through each one of the things, he, uh, you know, he looks at one painting. He's like, yes, I remember painting that. That one's not mine. This one's not mine. And, you know, he goes through, then the guy's got like maybe eight or ten paintings and, you know, he gets to the eighth painting and he's like, not one of mine. And the lawyer stops him and says, what do you mean that's not one of yours? I purchased that from you directly. And he looks at it again and smugly looks at the lawyer and says, I can fake a Picasso as good as anyone else. Um, not sure if you've heard that joke before. I, I, I don't know where I... I heard that one i don't know if that was in art school or not um but uh you know dogan does have the capacity to be squirrely as much as any human does i suppose but i do still i guess i revere his squirreliness a little bit more than rupert spira say or uh, who's another example, like in current times, um, say Muji. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. Um, so that's always fun. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I found, um, I was looking or listening to the audio again, and, and I guess we both do that. I, I also wrote down things when I hear you say them that, uh, I wanted to either elucidate on or ask you about, which reminds me the last time I was going to talk to you. Um, let me see if I can find it again. Um, do, 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 do. So I did find a PDF of uh, transformations and it's 57 pages. I haven't read through it yet. Uh, but I was going to ask you if, is, is that a complete text of your, your father's work? Um, you know, I, I've loved hearing you read from it and, um, and sharing it, you know, it's, it's amazing. Oh, that's, that's weird that, uh, it should end on page 20. I guess that's not weird, but coincidental. It should end on page 22. Um, so thank you for sharing that first off. Um, but that was something I wanted to ask you about. Was that, uh, 
whether or not that was a complete copy of it. Um, again, I guess an easier way to answer that would be to read it. No, that's, that's a lie. That wouldn't be easier. It would be easier to ask. But, yeah, that's me asking. As another note, um, I am in the process of looking for this deck. I noticed, um, I think it was in Golden Dawn Universe, I noticed that you were looking for that black and white uh, DNS publishing deck. I've I've got another copy somewhere around here. I, I can't even find the one that I colored in, but I know that I bought three of them. Um, one that I was going to do in um, color pencil, the other one that I was going to do either in watercolor or acrylic, and then the third one in case I messed up and didn't like how I did it, and, you know, to restart. But if I can find it and your student hasn't found a version that he wanted to paint or color, I will definitely let you know. I'm I'm on the look for that, so I will tell you. Uh, our basement just flooded, so I don't know if I've thrown things out. I was rereading the Practicus Knowledge Lecture today. Um, specifically, the... Let's see if I can find it. The portion on equilibration. Let me see. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It is the... It's stuffed right in that knowledge lecture, like right after the meditation. Um, or sorry, after the Garden of Eden after the fall. And it's the, oh, on the general guidance and purification of the soul. It says, learn first, O Practicus, of our ancient order that true equilibrium is the basis of the soul. If thou thyself has not a sure foundation, whereon wilt thou stand to direct the forces of nature? Um, so that made me think of, you know, like it goes back to... Um, even the neophyte, oh, I mean, everything always goes back to the neophyte for me again. Like, like we've said so many times already, you know, like I, for the past two decades at least, you know, every, every interaction that I've had has been from a golden dawn paradigm, you know. Um, and so, you know, when I read that, it makes me think of, unbalanced mercy and unbalanced severity, you know, um, and, and when you approach the Hierophant. And so it also makes me wonder, because I think in, in uh, Plato's Republic, you know, the way Socrates talks about balance, uh, you know, where it's namely the balance of the the logos the appetitive mind and the high spirited mind um and those three having you know their agreement in in the one you know um i i think you always look for balance you know like maybe stepping off, like you're saying, in one direction or the other, like when you're looking at a funhouse mirror, like maybe the stepping off is the action to learn why you shouldn't step off, you know? Um, it, it just, uh, between that and then, you know, I've been, I've also... <laughs> been rereading I, I laugh because uh you know like a lot of us i i'd never finish one book before starting another so right now i just am rereading dion fortune's uh the mystical kabbalah um and so you know like all these things it's it's a question of you know can I stay balanced and move in any of these directions or, or, you know, like, like you posit is moving to one or the other. Is that, 
what gets us off of balance or out of reconciliation, you know, to use that wonderful term. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, there might have been a brief period there where you weren't hearing anything. Um, what was going on is I th I'm I'm pausing this as I'm listening to you. Um, and I think I left it unpaused there for a minute or two. I apologize. But it, it brought up another thing that I was thinking about, which is... Um, I forget which one of the other, the, it may have been Aristotle or one of the other old Greeks who said that, um, oh no, it was, uh, Xenophanes, is that, how, I forget how you say his name, but, um, only a wise man will recognize another wise man. And, um, as I'm going through the mystical Kabbalah and, you know, Dion Fortune has this suggestion, and it's not anything new. It's not anything you don't know or anything I didn't know. Um, but she's got this suggestion that when you're going to do path working, how you should incorporate the entire symbolism into yourself before you do the path working. So, in other words, you know, like real quick example is if you're going to path work Tav, you know, um, you should meditate you should make a seed meditation out of the symbol of saturn and i did that yesterday i started doing that and i don't know why i didn't do that before you know like i've done it so few times when i was in the order you know like i remember again and this is going back to practica stuff i remember seeing the geomancy superimposed on the pentagram and you know, like that was the first time I did it. And it was at a power week at Gausti, you know, at the temple there. And, you know, like I had one of those revelatory moments where I saw, um, I was looking at the diagram and I saw Fortuna Major and Fortuna Minor at the top. And I saw, um, Via at the bottom and, you know, it took me forever, but I remember like, you know, cause I was asking myself and, and I think I had moved into practicus at that point. Like when we were there, like that was one of the physical initiations I was getting cause I didn't do it at Pata. Um, but I'm looking at the diagram and it's like, why in the hell is this like this? And you know, it, there was a sudden flash. It was one of those moments where, um, I noticed that it was the very, you know, like super similar, like holographic to the tablet of Shubrad or, you know, the image of the Holy Mother in Revelation where, you know, the sun at her head and the moon at her feet. And it's like, oh, wow. You know, and, and what's funny is, you know, it's, it's the pentagram itself, you know, so you've got this additional hay there. You know, um, or the the inferior Eve, and and you know, so like you've got the Earth mixing with these geomantic figures, and it's like it it suddenly started to make sense. Um, and I don't know why I never did seed meditations like that with anything else. You know, in other words, I guess not seed meditations, but where I didn't, you know, I wouldn't take an icon and just like sit and meditate with it for hours on end like i think that that must be something that other people who clearly are further along the path than i am um and i don't mean that in any self-effacing way i don't think but you know it's it's why didn't i do that you know like what what's that about but but rereading fortune you know and hearing her talk about these seed meditations it's like i know i definitely didn't do that when i was path working top for instance um so yeah that was just a, a thought <laughs> that came out of nowhere see that's and okay now going back to uh what you open with with the fukan zanzengi um 
you know, even that, like I, I only hear half of it sometimes. Like I, I heard the, <laughs> you're already there. Full stop period. I, I didn't hear the, the, but, you know, um, so anyways, that's just an observation of myself. I, I don't know why, uh, that came to mind. Which again goes back to these these other notions about why anything comes to mind. It comes back to that thought of, you know, um, when practicing self inquiry, you know, and and performing that meditation to get yourself to a point of non dual awareness, you know. Again, I I, I know I'm repeat myself, but. Uh, that notion of thought arises in awareness. Well, that's great, but why, you know, or not how, why, but how, you know, like, is it based on other thoughts? Just like I was, you know, like that moment of self clarity there, self awareness, um, or thought awareness, I guess, I don't know. Um, all that to say, you know, what's going on right there? Because here's here's another thing, you know, like I did that meditation on the symbol of Saturn yesterday, and it's, I had one of those revelation moments where once I got out of it, it's like, oh man, I already knew that, you know, but it wasn't in conscious awareness, you know, obviously, but it was that notion that if you look at the Saturn symbol, it's a scythe, you know, it's a stylized scythe, and, it, you know, like, I'm hearing the, as I'm I'm working on my meditation and I'm hearing the dead speak or I'm hearing a speech about the dead, you know, that notion about the symbol of Saturn comes up as a scythe and it's like, oh my God, it's a scythe, you know, and then I come back to conscious awareness and it's like, you knew that, you just forgot that you knew that. But again, I guess going back to Plato, all learning is remembering. I'm on a Plato kick today, clearly, even though I haven't read him for, uh, at least a couple of weeks. So at around uh, minute fifteen forty one, you're talking about um, that distrust that we as Americans have, um, you know, being founded the way we were, um, and and then you reference, you know, like a, a natural trust towards text like the Pali Canon, the Dhammapada you know, things that have a, a tradition. I mean, you know, like we even fell victim of this in the GD, you know, it's like, well, I have natural or not natural succession, but I have succession from Mathers, you know, like between Griffin and, and Zinc doing that garbage. Um, and I don't know when I joined the order, if that mattered to me at all. I know it'd be, it, started to after a while and then it stopped mattering again you know as these things are wont to do but uh i definitely fall prey to that you know like i'm one of those where it's like i don't want to read the preface or an introduction or the the prologue to a book i'd rather hear the author's thoughts and you know come up with my own preface or introduction i've been slowly fighting that because i've noticed that there are a lot of things that people write in those introductions that are well worth consideration and i can still keep my own opinion even after i've read that you know but but there's this weird you know like i don't want my mind tainted by this so that i can have a pure you know whatever experience of this author's work as though that's possible because, you know, again, thought comes out of nowhere from, from nothing. And, and when I read the word apple, it has no association with, you know, Adam and Eve or the garden or, you know, Macintosh, etc. you know, um, okay. That's tangential. You know, one of those non-dual thoughts that I had, uh, this is, skipping ahead a little bit to 2429 at least that's where i have my note at um yeah that notion that we can all be jesus and i guess you know I, i'm going to revisit this uh, a little bit later um that is to say that that notion uh that you 
point out at the end of the, the audio um, as far as what are ghosts and what are we like are you know is there some neural network that we're a part of um, you know and and I know you're gonna remember this one uh, having spoken about uh, Alan Watts you know one of my favorite talks is his talk on Indra's net you know um, Okay, so I don't know how this is related. Hold on, I related it in my head. Let me see if I can do this again. But it's this idea that um, I think the way that I look at reincarnation now is a little bit differently than I used to look at it. You know, I used to look at time more linearly um, and say to myself, you know, like if I had past lives. And I guess, I mean reincarnation gets away from this but the the notion of a past life doesn't because that kind of forces you to look at lives that you've lived before um i guess all that to say that you know um i'm starting to get on with this notion that we are all living the same life um just at a different time or in a different space or in a different dimension if you like um that in fact uh you know you're living or i'm living your life here in the midwest um having grown up with all the situations from genetic xeno and phenotype to culture and you know upbringing to things as slight as you know, having read that, uh, you know, Ezra Pound's Cantos or something, you know, but that's been changing slowly but surely. But yeah, I, I definitely can get on with the notion, you know, and, and I, again, I'm going to go back to all learning is remembering. If Plato's right about that, or, you know, he alludes to Socrates saying that, but if either of them are right about that, you know, then maybe that links that kind of thing up, you know, like maybe we've had all of these experience experiences or we're going to have them in a three dimensional model of the world, but in a fifth dimensional model of the world, we've already had them. Um, or I guess a more clear way to say that is that we're already having them simultaneously. Um, and so there is a way to tap into that that Christ consciousness in that sense, you know, like that's that's a way in which we can all be Christ, you know. Um, and it allows itself, I think, to 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 bridge out from that. Um, again, I feel like I'm I'm rambling a little bit, but it's like. Um, if that is the case, and I should have access to um, my memory of or the phenomena of having been Christ, then I should be able to enter into that mental scape at 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 some level. Um, it also goes back to you know the the guys that I spoke with when I was working at the, or not working, but when I was meditating at the, the empty circle Zen group, you know, who, who will tell you, you know, anything done with equanimity is what is most perfect. And it was mirrored when I did that Vipassana retreat with, uh, you know, the, the Goenka one where, you know, it's all about equanimity. And, and I guess, you know, <laughs> I, I had a, a moment where when I was, and I don't remember what day it was now, but when I was on that 10-day retreat, um, there came a point at which, you know, I was trying to understand, because Goenka gave a Dharma talk at the end of one of the sessions, and, you know, he went over how um, one of the ways to reveal your own Buddhahood, again, is to go back to equanimity, you know equanimous mind equanimous mind um and i mean like in that sense you know and and okay hold on i'm 
talking faster than I'm thinking. In that sense, um, it seems super easy. There, there was a moment where I, I'm sorry, I apologize for the babbling, but um, you know, I had this moment where I was kind of astrally projecting, kind of not. It wasn't on purpose, you know, like because uh, I'm not sure if you've taken one of those retreats or not or if we've talked about it, but, you know, he says to give fair play to his technique, you know, just do his technique. And there was a point at which I was meditating and, you know, all of a sudden I'm thinking about equanimous mind and, um, I'm kind of lifted up into the, the astral realm. Um, that's not right. It, it seemed like outer space and I see these four pillars, you know, uh, there's, and I'm kind of swirling or, or circling in the center of these four pillars and on each of the four pillars are these beings and I'll call them Buddhas cause that's what I thought they were when I saw it, but they were kind of alien looking, you know, and one of them said they they quoted Rudolf Steiner, or maybe Rudolf Steiner was quoting them, I don't know. But, you know, it was something to the effect of when you can see the world without tears in your eyes, and I'm horribly misquoting it um, or paraphrasing it, but it's something to the effect of when you can see the world without tears in your eyes, then you'll have true vision, you know, and it's that equanimity that I didn't understand then. Cause you know, like rapists and pedophiles and murderers, etc. And it's like, if, if reincarnation is going on like that, where we are all the same being, you know, then that kind of explains that it's, it's still hard for the conscious mind to, you know, want to integrate that level of what I find to be my shadow right now, you know, to, to use those terms, but you know, like again, the murderers, rapists, pedophiles of the world, the, the kinds of drug dealers who are dealing heavy, sh heavy shit and bad shit, you know, like on purpose. So, you know, corporate America, um, on one level, but, but again, I'm rambling at about 29 minutes and you start talking about, uh, you know, you got to repent and stop doing what you're doing. That's a, another word that has become interesting for me. Um, specifically metanoia, you know, this whole notion of turning inward, you know, um, have you ever seen it translated that way? Like, uh, the changing your mind, you know, like, and, and not just changing your mind, but, you know, refocusing everything on the inside. I just thought that was curious.
So that was the beginning of uh, Fukan Zazengi, the, uh, as far as I know, the first of the Japanese Zen documents written by Ehei, Zog uh, Ehei Dogen, same guy who wrote Shobogenzo. I think I mentioned it uh, in the previous audio. And um, I was actually looking for a line-by-line -line translation so that I could send you exactly the lines that I'm going to read the translation of. But uh, it took too long and, you know, neither one of us speak Japanese, so no need to be that nerdy. So here it goes, the English translation of the opening. The way is originally perfect and all-pervading. How could it be contingent upon practice and realization? The Dharma vehicle is utterly free and untrammeled. What need is there for our concentrated effort? Indeed, the whole body is far beyond the world's dust. Who could believe in a means to brush it clean? It is never apart from you right where you are. What use is there going off here and there to practice? And yet, if there is the slightest discrepancy, the way is as distant as heaven from earth. If the least like or dislike arises, the mind is lost in confusion. Suppose you gain pride of understanding, inflate your own achievement, glimpse the wisdom that runs through all things, attain the way and clarify your mind, raising an aspiration to escalate to the very sky. You are making an initial partial ex excursion through the frontiers of the Dharma, but you are still deficient in the vital way of total emancipation. It goes on. It's a good document. Um, maybe you've looked at it before. Uh, the reason why... I, I, the, it was mostly like the first two-thirds of what I read that was the thing that I wanted to... that I was being reminded of. So on the subject of like Ellen Watts's thing about, you know, the, the good guru will just say, hey, well, you're already there. You don't need, you know, this long road um, so Dogen's kind of addressing that sort of paradox that uh, yes yes it is all right here right now and you know so why should you need a path why should you need a practice it's right there in front of you and yet if there's any like disalignment any, um, you know, missing the mark, you could say, you know, uh, if there's a slightly distorted view or a slightly off center, you know, like if you, like if, if you're looking at a hall of mirrors, have you ever done that? I'm sure you have. Everybody has, uh, where you have a mirror behind you and a mirror in front of you, but you can't see the perfect straight hall of mirrors because your own head's in the way so you can't actually see that infinity point that vanishing point because you have to look at it from the, a slight angle to see far down the hallway but once you're looking at a slight angle the hallway curves off to the left or to the right and if you're standing perfectly in the center then you can't see through your own head so one of the other things i wanted to ask you about too was um as far as flexibility for, say, sitting lotus, is Hatha Yoga a good starting place? Um, I mean, it's clearly a good starting place. Let me let me give you my uh, what's the word for it? Um, my qualifications. So, for my life since about twelve years old, as with most of us that have been in, you know. Magical. I don't know why that is, but I, I find that a lot of us have also practiced martial arts for a long time. Um, it could be the meditative element. I don't know. That That's neither here nor there. But since 12, um, you know, I've been in 
a whole slew of, of different kind of martial arts and my hips are the tightest things ever because for a long time, particularly when I was in wrestling, um, I would deadlift until, until I couldn't walk. And it has a way of, if you're not f familiar with its, you know, with the consequence of it, you probably are, but, um, the, the hip joints, or, wow, my lack of anatomy here, the hips just become super tight. And I know that there's a couple of bands in there, um, that are deeply affected by, um, deadlifting. And so that coupled with a few, um, I've had the, my knee out of socket a couple of times. Um, and that was, that's also put a strain on, um, folding my legs properly. And so I can always stand to use more exercise. And I was thinking, you know, like, is, is that a good route for everybody? I mean, like, cause like the stuff that gets done in, in Hatha yoga and, and again, you know, this is me just showing my ignorance, you know, like with the downward dog stuff and, you know, the, the other, you know, like sun salutations and things like that. Um, it doesn't seem like it would loosen up the hips at all, you know? Um, I imagine Ashtanga yoga would do that. I don't know enough. Uh, I, I had, a, I bought a video on Amazon years ago of Ashtanga yoga and I, um, I've never used it much because it was way above my pay grade. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something I'd also, you know, like, um, I'd like to be able to do, you know, I, one of the things that I do every now and again, and it's just when I remember, and it's specifically when my my uh, legs or, or lower back are hurting as I get into pigeon pose. Um, but that's about it. You know, that's, it's one of those places where it's like, man, I, to do it all over again, I definitely wouldn't have worked out like I did. And I mean, not for nothing, you know, like it, it's a valuable lesson. I was going to talk a little bit more about the Thoth invocation, you know, cause, uh, he brought that back up. Um, and you know it's 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 funny how things go in cycles um or maybe it's not funny maybe it's just hermetic <laughs> but uh you know before i had joined the order um i had a couple of different applications in a couple of different places for instance you know um so i had one with the order uh, i had an application with uh a the Lemma encampment in Chicago. Um, and then uh, there was an application to the AA. Um, and I know there was, oh, and also the BOTA. Yeah, those were the, the applications. But, um, you know, what was what was going on at that time? And I don't know if I've, I've told you this story before, but uh, you know, at the time I was listening to the Regardi CDs, um, which I think I bought through New Falcon before Chris Hyatt's son took it. Well, yeah, it was way before that. But I was listening to Regardi performing the Thoth, you know, um, on every drive to and from college. Um, I would be performing it at night. And, and mind you, this is with no current behind me and, and really no firm magical practice to speak of because I didn't know what I was doing then. And I, I mean, I still don't, but I knew less then. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those things where at that time it was so much more like the the... Ganesha, like the Gayatri mantra, you know, and, or at least my understanding of it, you know, it, it was definitely a breaker of obstacles because, uh, I was at bare bones, you know, all I was doing was going to school and studying magic, which miss those days, you know, those, those were fun. Um, 
and so what was the point i was uh, here i go rambling again so i was doing all that and clearly the order was the one to respond back first but you know i don't think i understood spirit back then in that way you know where it's like the the whole non-dual aspect of it um which is kind of amazing um uh i think in one of the earlier messages we had i was talking about gandhi saying how there's no such thing as conversion and have you seen the film uh silence it's the Martin Scorsese one. It's got Adam Garfield, Adam Driver, and Liam Neeson in it. It's an awesome movie. Um, and if you haven't, I don't want to spoil anything, but it's like um, the idea, you know, like, again, it's one of those things like silence is thy name for what else can I call thee? You know, because you, you realize how much gets lost in translation. But at the same time, it's like, it's like watching the religious version of the heart of darkness or, you know, something like that. Um, anyway, that was, that was just one of those rambling thoughts. Um, and going back to, to something else that you mentioned, I, I haven't, I have a couple of different copies of the yoga sutras. Um, I've never sat down and actually read them, which after listening to this, I'm going to um, definitely, you know, give that a, a a look over again. And it's funny, you know, I just wanted to, wow, I, I wonder why I always preface things where I, you know, when I say things like, I just wanted to add to this or, you know, like clearly I wanted to add to this, otherwise it wouldn't be speaking but uh that is one of those things like you know we were talking about how you've you've got at least three books out at a time or four and so one of my fictional books is naked lunch and when you brought up burrows you know <laughs> made me think of i'm not an addict i am the addict you know i don't know if you, you you've ever heard him say that speech it was it's kind of awesome you know and it's I think it's even in that same speech where he starts talking about um, why am I hooked on reality? Or if, if he didn't say that, maybe that's something I attributed to him when I heard that, you know, it's like, that's an, again, another one of those places where it's like a, an entry road into non-dualism. Um, so I've got another note here as uh, words as a virus. Um, and that going back to, you know, the notions of grim wars or grammars or spells and, you know, the whole Thothian idea there, that, which again, you know, here, here I go, I guess we're just, you know, like this is my, uh, swapping media portion of our messages, uh, another one. And I think they're getting ready to make this into a film, but, uh, Snow Crash, was the first place where I'd heard of uh, reference the Bible as a virus, you know, like the way that it changed minds and massive amounts of minds. Um, one of the things I, I, so you have no idea how happy you made me when I, uh, I realized that the, um, the sonnets are on YouTube still. Ironically, the dance utters tersely for a door. The sensitive pill drains real nice down some ice. I remember when, when you were um, posting that, and I love it so much. Like, I don't think I knew the idea behind that before, and that's that's kind of amazing, you know? Um, wow. Like, it, it it's definitely inspirational. Like, <sighs> Sorry, I'm, I'm gushing here a little bit. I can't remember where I placed or why I placed this note here, but because um, I was trying to listen to the uh, the audio again as, as you were talking. And um, let me see what I have. Uh, oh. This is something that I wrote about uh, 
Burroughs because I didn't know that he had chopped up. I said, holy shit, that's an amazing way to write when, when you find out that he was chopping up the words. Um, one of the things that I, it, it reminded me of, okay, now that, now I got it. Um, a thing I did with the Bhagavad Gita once was I, I didn't chop it up and, you know, pretend that it was my own or anything like that. No, I, I made a sigil out of the concept of the Bhagavad Gita and rather than read it, cause I've read it before, um, I scribed the sigil, you know, and and it was interesting. I mean, you know, I'd like to do it again. You know, I, I feel like I might get, as with anything, you know, I'll get more out of it now than I would have then. But um, I thought that was worth sharing. So, you know, I'm trying to think of other places where what you were talking about with the English, um, the British English that happened over there, you know, it's funny. um There are words that, and and I guess this is similar, but not the same, but there are words in Spanish that, uh, you know, I've learned from family, et cetera, over here, that when I've gone back to Puerto Rico, you know, they'll look at me and it's like, what the hell language is this guy speaking? You know, it's, it's not very many, it's phrases, you know, but, um, you know, wonderful how language lives like that um so for right now you know like i i'm still i'm still working on on what my non-dual ritual is um i haven't had a chance to well i, I shouldn't say i haven't had a chance i haven't been able to make up my mind as far as what to do to enter that state or again you know and I mean, this is still a solid possibility, but, you know, maybe I'm just grasping at straws. Maybe there is no ritual to enter that mental state. Um, it's just something that uh, Ruach or Ego wants, you know. Um, good that it wants it, I suppose, you know. Better that it wants that than, um, you know, a giant mansion and whatever else. I, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I don't even place... No, clearly I do place judgment on that still. Um, the judgment's not the same, though. You know, like, there was a time where, you know, again, when I started magic, when I started practicing occultism, probably a better way to put it, you know, that was for a lack and, you know, deeply rooted in the lack of power, um, as you do, or as some people do, and then it got to this place where I felt like I needed to be altruistic, and I'm sure five, six oaths aside, um, that had nothing to do with it, right? But um, but now I'm back at that place where it's like, you know, we live in matter, we work in matter, and I mean, it's cliched, not nearly as cliched as as above, so below. Um, and and when I say that I'm I, I, here, I go qualifying again. Um, when I say that, I don't mean cliched in the sense that it's uh, inaccurate or well. I mean, cliche doesn't mean that; it just means that it's overused. But it is overused, and I think improperly sometimes. But you know, who? What do I know? Um, in any event. Um, you know, I'm back at that point now where matter is not, I want to say matter is not divorced from spirit, but if that's the case, then why are you even practicing, you know, is it to recognize that fact? Who knows? But, um, I recognize that at least at some level as being a truth. Um, so if, you know, if somebody practices magic to, to get a, a mansion or a new car or things, you know, more power to you. Um, I just, all I mean to say is that my, my ego's need to enter that non-dual state via ritual is still grasping at a thing. Um, whether or not it'd be a spiritually noble thing or not, 
Um, I think I'll stop right there. Um, yeah, that's that's a good place to, to stop for right now. The emptying uh, may be by breath, by uh, a riddle. It may be by a mantra, all right? And even by a Christian mantra with Christian words. But it doesn't matter how you empty your mind. It just matters what happens in the brain when your mind is completely empty. Now, when you go into this kind of meditation, what happens first is, right now, as you're listening to me, we, you are in fast wave beta, very rapid brain wave. And this rapid brain wave helps you to assess, evaluate what I'm telling you. For example, you will uh, be wondering if I'm telling you the truth or I'm telling you something inaccurate. You're bringing in data that you remember from previously and comparing them. So you're in rapid and alert beta. But when you meditate, you go into alpha wave which is a slow wave, just before you sleep, all right? And as I talk to you, you may hear three words or four words, and you will miss out the, the rest. Out of, you know, out of 10, you may hear three or four words. And then as you meditate deeper, you go into tether, which is a sleep wave. And there you are tranquil, you are imagining things, and you are floating. Your mind is floating. You're not alert. Now, the other thing that happens is when you're meditating, you calm immediately, you calm your amygdala, which also makes you tranquil. So you begin to be really feeling good, right? almost sedated. Right? Now, other things happen. Your brain secretes dopamine. Now, dopamine is addictive, and it causes meditators to meditate all the time. Right? In Bali, where I go, in, in, in central Bali, uh, people come to look at a scene, and by, by evening, they're tired and they go back to the city where there's nightlife and, 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 and enjoyment and shopping. But the meditators come to central Bali, and they stay for four or five days, and they meditate for six hours a day, talking to nobody, because things are happening in their brain, and they're addicted to it. Now, dopamine also causes visualization. Uh, if a, a, a psychiatrist shows you an ink blot, you know, they put an ink blot and they open it, and some people see a butterfly. But when you have in, 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 with dopamine in your brain, you can see a jet plane, or, or you can see two women talking, you know, and so it causes visualization. So meditators can see God, angels. They can see electric lights. That's dopamine. Now, the most uh, dramatic thing that happens in the brain is this. And this a scientist called Andrew Newbar, he was, he was looking at brain of meditators as they meditate. So when he says, when you're meditating on emptying your mind, uh, mantra or uh, breath or whatever, what happens is you're screening off all incoming data into your frontal lobe. When you succeed in screening off all, all data and you're, you're, you're starving your frontal lobe, when you're denying information, your parietal lobe goes down. Now, what is your parietal lobe? The parietal lobe is what tells you where you are in three-dimensional space. Now, take me for, a, for an example. I'm sitting here. I'm 20 feet from my friends. I'm five feet from the edge of the garden. Right? I've got my hand on this table. And the parietal even tells me where the kind of body shape I have, you know, that my arm is on the table. Now, when the parietal goes down, I lose all that. I don't know where I am in three-dimensional space. I don't feel my body shape. So in that moment, I become part of the whole universe. And the whole universe is part of me. Or in other words, I, be, I am the whole universe. So assuming that um, <clears throat> upon hearing my voice right now, you have just uh, finished hearing someone else's voice, that means that my music editor is working. That clip that I just played for you um, was actually part of a longer YouTube video. That's a Japanese guy who was a Zen Buddhist meditator until he was 30 years old, and then he became a Seventh-day Adventist. And the, uh, the YouTube video is talking about 
the difference between Eastern meditation and, and biblical meditation. And uh, in his estimation, Eastern meditation is basically evil and selfish. And he defines biblical meditation as defined by one of the Psalms. Um, so it's like, okay, was that before or after you are supposed to have sex with another man's wife and then have that man killed and then have a falling out with God? And well, anyway, <laughs> like, I don't know if the, the, the logic is uh, followed through all the way, but you know, Seventh day Adventists. But sometimes a critic of, of a thing can actually be a really good source of information about a thing, as in the example of, I believe, Valentinius and a few others who were passionately anti Gnostic and also happened to be great sources of information about what the heck the Gnostics were doing to begin with. If you filter through all the, they're evil and terrible and they molest babies and they believe this and this and this and this and this. And it's like taking notes like real fast, like, okay, okay, go back again. What, what was that? You know, but um, anyhow, so, but I, I cut out that part because I found it very interesting. And, uh, you know, on the subject of, um, uh, yeah, you had mentioned meditation and on the subject of um, achieving the uh, non-dual state of consciousness. Okay, trying this one more time. I think I figured out how to listen to uh, your voicemail um, and respond at the same time. I didn't notice the pause button, um, so that's always fun. But yeah, uh, what's funny, it, it, it strikes me as odd, you know, that, that we can learn so much about a practice from um, a non-practitioner or uh, a former practitioner, you know, someone who has become disheartened. Um, it's so weird to me that somebody would go from Zen Buddhism, you know, like that long, and then convert to to that, what's the word for it, um, fundamentalist, perhaps, <laughs> uh, viewpoint, and then consider the, the other way evil, but, you know, I guess it happens all the time and in all places. Um, it's also weird now, you know, having done more and more of the non-dual self-inquiry, um, where Yeheshua Mihi Omnia takes on a whole new meaning, you know, um, it's, you know, if, if all of these experiences rather not experiences, but if all phenomena, um, sensory phenomena is illusory, you know, according to the non-dual standpoint, you know, one way of looking at that, and of course, this goes back to what we were talking about before, where things get mutated from one system to another, but, um, you know, it's, it's an easy way to get into a kind of cloud of unknowing, non-dual Christ is everywhere at all times in all things kind of thing like when I get into that space of complete unity like it's it it might just be maturity um with the practice you know um but it it's kind of sad to me that I had to go out of the practice to get back into the practice myself. So I'm kind of mirroring this Zen Buddhist where I had to stop all of my um, adept work. And I don't even want to use that term, but, you know, um, we'll say Rosicrucian practices uh, and, and magical practices to understand that one line, you know, um, and what an amazing line it is. And it goes back to what you were saying uh, two messages ago about, you know, standing in the column. How perfect and non-dual is that? 
like we were talking about with the last message, you know, um, I'm actually kind of happy for that. I don't need any more of these egregores, tulpas, thought forms pulling at my soul, <laughs> um, to put it lightly. One of the other things, though, that uh, that comes to mind now after having practice this non-dual awareness for a while is, you know, um, and none of the YouTube teachers or the books want to answer this question, but, you know, as Kabbalists, we have answers for it. Um, and that is, you know, if, again, all of this phenomena, sensory phenomena is illusory and including outside of sensory phenomena, but thoughts, if thoughts are illusory, um, in the sense that I am not my thoughts, but I am just pure awareness. Where the hell do these thoughts come from? You know, I started reading this book. Uh, I'm trying to grab it. It's called An Elementary Textbook of Psychoanalysis by Charles Brenner. Um, haven't gotten very far, but, you know, Brenner has this. Uh, he posits he he provides two theories i forget what the second one is but the first one is uh what is called um thought regression and and i'm sorry i'm butchering it but i'm not going to open the book up right now i can tell you what what it essentially means and um which is that all thoughts are based on thoughts that come before them which is why in a lot of cases you know we of the 3000 thoughts we might have a day 2,900 of them are the exact same thoughts, you know, but part of what evolves is, are those 100 thoughts, you know, those, those tiny thoughts that, that get through the cracks that are different from the other 2,900. And that's where a new thought, technically new thought kind of develops. Before I go on with that though, I did want to mention, um, the other parallel, uh, you know, as I told you, I, I I know I mentioned this to you when we were talking on the Esoteria Nerd podcast. Um, prior to being a Theoricus, I was still practicing Zen meditation at the Empty Circle School. Um, and that was another thing after the, the split that I kind of went back into and then kind of got really heavy into... Um, like say about a year ago um and while there you know it's it's funny and and i think this you know in part at least in part this comes to some of the talks that you and i were having in between those times but i picked up a uh a translation of the shovel genzo by guru nishijima um i don't know what I have there with that book, uh, I've read, uh, at least the first hundred pages, but I see that there are like four volume sets of it that have been translated into English. So, and this one's supposed to be completely contained. So I don't know if it's the Shobogenzo itself or what it is, but you know, that's another one of those places that, that parallel where, where you and I have been. And I suspect a lot of initiate, a lot of initiates, you know, what they do. Um, so based on just what we're talking about, I, I'm going to definitely take a dive back into that. Um, I think one of the cool things about syncretism is, you know, the, the, the idea that I don't have to worry about where I get my inspirations from, you know, cause like, as I'm sitting here and I'm looking at my desk, uh, I've got that book elements of psychoanalysis. I've got the Shobo Genzo out. I've got Willie Schroeder's Rosicrucian notebook. And then, um, the unfolding wings, which is a book on Neoplatonism by Tim Addy or a day. Um, so always a fun thing about syncretism, but at the same time, you know, like because of this binary world that we live in and, you know, like chapter two of the Tao Te Ching would tell us, you know, as soon as there is beauty, there is ugliness, you know? Um, so on the positive spectrum or the positive side of that, 
great that we can pull from all these sources. At the same time, one of the things that makes me figuratively pull my hair out is this notion of not having a lineage or tradition that I can pull from to answer all these questions. And, you know, that's, that's how one builds their own tradition, I suppose. But, you know, that is what it is. I just, I'm kind of rambling there. Okay, I totally forgot where I was at because I had to pause this. I had a few meetings today and um, after doing a little bit of work here, I was able to get back to the conversation. Um, one of the other things that strikes me as odd or something that I've been playing with for a while is this idea of, you know, whenever you ask any of the non-dual guys, and by non-dual guys, I mean like Gregory Good or Richard Doyle or uh, Rupert Spira, um, these Western mystics who've approached non-dualism, and, you know, they, they're, if they haven't reached the peak of a mountain, um, for lack of a better analogy, uh, they're at least sitting in higher seats than most. Um, I guess all that, you know what? I hate that highfalutin shit. Um, they're, they just, they have more experience, right? And so when you ask them though, where thoughts come from, you always get the squirrely sneaky answer from inside of awareness. Okay, so, um, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I had to pause it again. Um, when you talk to one of these guys about where thought comes from, uh, what you get is a response of thought is in awareness, you know? Uh, this is, this is one of these ideas that pulls me back and forth. It's, you know, I, I love the non-dual state. I love it. Um, and maybe thought shouldn't matter, but it's like, where does that arising come from, you know? Um, is it possible to discover where thought comes from inside of there? Like, uh, again, I go back to something I'm sure I was rambling about earlier, which is, you know, this idea of recursive thought about thought being based on previous thought, etc. Um, you know, but they don't answer that, and then they don't, the other one I don't have a solid answer for is why is phenomena unfolding the way that it is, you know? Um, is it just happenstance, you know? Um, is this where notions of karma come from, you know, like this is what... Uh, we get to see play out, and I, I hate to use words I truly don't understand, and that is one of them, you know, um, but, you know, what's going on with that part, you know, it's like, that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm, you know, I'm like stuck between a rock and a hard place, or, you know, like, it's, the practice is non-dual, but at the same time, it's theurgic, and, you know, there's grasping, and there's not grasping, and, you know, there's avoiding, and there's not avoiding, um, so all that fun stuff, you know, um, yeah, I, I guess I'll leave it right there for right now, and I'll send up, and send you this, uh, kind of choppy, kind of, uh, you know, different piecemeal parts of my thought, and we'll keep going, you know, let's keep digging. Brother, like I said last time, uh, and and I won't end this way every time, I guess, or maybe I will, I don't know, who, who knows, let, let the moment carry itself, but um, I always love hearing your voice. I appreciate your thought process, because as you've said, uh, it is similar to my own and um, in a lot of ways, so I... I'm truly grateful for you taking the time out to 
even consider any of this. Um, that's my bit of groveling. <laughs> so, uh, again, thanks, and I'll talk to you soon. Much love, 120. Thank you, Augustine, for the many years of friendship and brotherhood, and for the great conversations that we've all just heard. Thank you for being my guest this one last time on the Esoteric Nerd Podcast. Special thanks to Susumu Ueda, as well as his father and the other monks at Jofuku Inn on Mount Koyasan, for the music you're hearing right now. Special thanks to Camille and Kennerly for the harp intro and outro to the audio files in today's episode. And most importantly, most importantly, special thanks to you for partaking with us in this uh, sharing and this requiem today. And, um, all right, well, uh, until next time, I hope you're doing well, staying healthy and, uh, happy, and I hope you have a wonderful day or a wonderful night, depending on when you're seeing this or listening to this. I'll, I'll close with the uh, prayer my dad and I used to do at the uh, end of our meditations while I was growing up. <clears throat> to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below, we send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Until next time.